Carlin. I'm the Director of Strategic Studies and the Merrill Center for Strategic Studies, and I'm very excited to welcome Secretary of Defense Esper here today. Two years ago, his predecessor, Secretary Mattis, stood on this stage and delivered the National Defense Strategy. Uh, just over a year ago or so, the former CNO, Gary Ruffhead, and the former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Eric Edelman, stood on this stage and delivered the Independent National Defense Strategy Commission's views on the, on the National Defense Strategy. And today we have the Secretary of Defense discussing the NDS at two. How's it going, et cetera. While he needs no introduction, I do wanna take a quick moment for the students in particular. Because when you read Secretary Esper's bio, it is astonishing to see the different spots in which he has thought about defense policy. He's thought about it in the military. He's thought about it in the think tank community. He's thought about it in the Congress. He's thought about it in industry. And oh, by the way, he got a PhD. So he has managed to sit in a number of different perches, and I think that is what has enabled him to be such a tremendously effective Secretary of Defense. So please join me in welcoming Secretary of Defense Esper. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Mara, for that kind introduction. Very gracious. Nice to be here at SICE. By the way, how many students are here? Good. Well, your faculty told me that if you're here, you get a 10% boost in your GPA. Uh, part of your homework rate, right? Is that fair? Yeah. Okay, good. Very well. Well, look, I want to thank SICE and uh, the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies for inviting me here today. It is, it is really an honor and a privilege. A special, a special thank you to SICE Dean uh, Elliot Cohn, who I've known for many years, and to the Merrill Center's Associate Director, Paula Thornhill, for playing such an important role in training the national security leaders of tomorrow. That's all of you. Thank you very much. Just over two years ago, as Mara mentioned, in January of 2018, the National Defense Strategy was officially unveiled right here at SAIS. The creation of that strategy was the, was the result of a collective recognition that the security landscape has fundamentally changed. Effectively preparing for the future would require a new approach to how we equip, posture, and employ military forces around the world. The NDS outlined the United States' plan to maintain competitive advantage in a new era of great power competition, where revisionist powers seek to rewrite the international rules-based order and the norms of good behavior. Take China and Russia. Both countries have violated the sovereignty of their neighbors and routinely used coercive strategies against smaller states to gain strategic advantages. Beijing continues to perpetuate intellectual property theft while attempting to control the economic and security decisions of other nations through its Belt and Road investments. Meanwhile, Moscow has turned to hybrid warfare as a means to expand regional influence at the expense of law-abiding nations while also breaking treaty obligations and engaging in malicious cyber operations. We also face continued threats from rogue states like Iran and North Korea that require our constant, constant vigilance. Our recent actions against the Iranian regime, for example, restored deterrence in the region and sent the message that the United States will not stand idly by when our troops and interests are threatened. The NDS prepares us to overcome these challenges through three major lines of effort. First, we are strengthening military readiness and investing in the modernization of a more lethal force. Second, we are building alliances and attracting new partners around the globe. And third, we are reforming the department for greater performance and accountability. As we mark this two-year anniversary of the NDS, we are looking to the road ahead with a focus on irreversible implementation. To achieve our goals, it is critical that Congress provide us with predictable timely and sufficient defense budgets. <clears throat> Our past three annual budgets I knew from the outset have enabled being tasked with judging the president. I guess the, the news came on. <laughs> I got preempted. I have <laughs> I was not wrong. Our past three annual budgets have enabled us to begin rebuilding readiness and modernizing the force after years of funding shortfalls and continuing resolutions. 
But to stay on the right track, we will need more support from the, year, from the Hill in the years ahead. In a matter of days, we will present to Congress our fiscal year 2021 request, which reflects our commitment to making and maintaining major changes that will implement the national defense strategy. This budget will allow us to invest in a more lethal force, to realign our mission and operations around the globe, and to ensure accountability for every taxpayer dollar. President Trump and congressional leadership have already made significant investments in the modernization of our armed forces, which advances our first line of effort. From fighter jets to naval vessels to each leg of the nuclear triad, we are making solid progress in boosting operational readiness and lethality. To maintain our competitive advantage in the face of tomorrow's threats, we have invested in technologies like artificial intelligence, 5G, hypersonics, and quantum physics. Through our new Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, we're pulling all of our data and putting the warfighter into the cloud. We're working alongside industry to test US 5G technology at our military bases while we encourage the private sector to lead the way on alternatives to Huawei. We have also ramped up our long-term investment in hypersonic weapons with an additional $5 billion over the Future Years Defense Program, and we plan to deliver this capability years ahead of schedule. Meanwhile, we established the United States Space Command and bolstered our offensive and defensive cyberspace programs. We recently swore in the first Chief of Space Operations and are making great strides in standing up the United States Space Force. The creation of a new military service is not only a historic moment for our country, but also a new chapter for the Pentagon, as we recognize the urgency of U.S. dominance in every warfighting domain. But ultimately, ultimately, readiness and lethality rely on more than just a new technology and organizational changes. To harness the full potential of our efforts, we must also modernize how we fight. Our budget request supports the development of a new joint warfighting concept, which includes all the main operations. This new doctrine will enable dynamic force employment, which is a new concept that keeps our military operationally unpredictable and therefore more lethal, flexible, adaptable. Our second line of effort capitalizes on a strategic advantage that our adversaries do not possess, a robust network of like-minded allies and partners. Across the world, we are strengthening our relationships with our traditional allies while growing new partnerships to help smaller states stand up to Chinese coercion. I personally have traveled to the Indo-Pacific region twice now as Defense Secretary and continue to build upon our relationships there with countries of all sizes. They recognize better than anyone the threats posed by a rising China. And they share our desire to uphold international norms and values. Together, we are working to a free, toward a free, open, and prosperous Indo-Pacific. We will continue to work by, with, and through our partners in other parts of the world as well, as we strengthen our transatlantic bonds with our European allies. A ready and capable NATO is vital to our collective security, and we are pleased to see member states increasing their investments to advance burden sharing. Last December, at the NATO Leaders Meeting in London, we met our goal of identifying 100% of the contributions for the NATO Readiness Initiative, the first ever. This plan provides the Alliance with the capability to have 30 mechanized battalions, 30 combat vessels, and 30 air squadrons ready to fight in 30 days or less. Additionally, as President Trump noted during the State of the Union this week, the number of allies now meeting the 2% of GDP commitment has more than doubled. NATO members are contributing an additional $130 billion cumulatively in defense spending since 2016 and are projected to add over $400 billion by 2024. Their investments are especially important as the Alliance considers, considers expanding its train, advise, and assist mission in the Middle East, helping to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS, which is a priority for all of us. Our ability to invest in these relationships and build our readiness relies on the success of our third major line of effort, that is reforming the Department for greater performance and accountability. At the end of last year, we completed our second department-wide audit, which had, was no small feat for the nation's largest employer. Nearly three million military and civilian personnel work for the DOD, operating on every continent, flying roughly 14,000 aircraft and maintaining over 570 
5,000 facilities around the world. Ongoing annual reviews of this expansive enterprise are necessary to keep us on track. After my confirmation as Secretary of Defense, we launched a new initiative called the Defense-Wide Review, which was a historic step in freeing up time, money, and manpower to reinvest back into our top priorities. Over the course of four months, we examined $99 billion in appropriate resources across the fourth estate, which is comprised of roughly 50 DOD organizations outside of the military departments. Ultimately, this process gener generated well over $5 billion in savings. The majority of it came from reductions to legacy activities that don't adequately support the NDS requirements, as well as decreasing overhead and shedding lower priority programs. We also identified over $2 billion in activities to transfer to the military departments. These savings will be invested in cutting edge innovation and war fighting requirements of our core missions, including a strong and reliable nuclear deterrent, missile defense, hypersonics, AI, secure 5G technologies, the Space Force, and responsive force readiness. Our reform effort also includes major changes to our internal management systems, many of which are remnants of the Cold War. We have integrated our leadership teams to achieve results more efficiently and effectively and, and altered our internal battle rhythm. We now have weekly meetings that bring together senior military and civilian leaders from across the force to discuss our progress on the NDS and maintain accountability for outcomes. Additionally, we are establishing a new governance model for the fourth estate, which the chief management officer will lead. This, force, this will force tough trade-offs between these organizations and field activities rather than passing on cost growth to the services. I've also launched a review of combatant commands to identify opportunities to, re to rebalance troops and resources in support of the NDS. We have focused thus far on AFRICOM and SOUTHCOM and will continue our way through all of the combatant commands over the succeeding months to scrutinize our missions, our tasks, our requirements, and our resources. As we continue to review our activities, structures, and operating systems, we ask Congress for their support. At the end of the day, the success of our reforms and our NDS priorities will rely heavily on their leadership, both for the 2021 authorization and appropriations bills and beyond. I'd also like to mention a personal priority of mine, that is the well-being of our service members and their families. These men and women are the backbone of our national security and it's our duty to ensure they and their families are cared for so that they can focus on their mission. This means providing safe and affordable housing, and improving access to quality child care for military families, particularly in the areas that are experiencing staffing shortages. And it means supporting professional development opportunities to help military spouses advance in their careers as well. The, the department is addressing each of these areas to better attract and retain people who have made the U.S. military the greatest fighting force in the world. On the subject of people impacting change, let me end with the example of Paul H. Nitze, the namesake of this great institution. Nitsi was a chief architect of the United States military strategy during the Cold War. You all know that well. He's often remembered for his advocacy of U.S. military investment to deter the Soviet Union's hegemonic ambitions. His urgent calls for the United States to foster a technological edge over its competitors created a legacy that is reflected in many of our priorities now, nearly 70 years later. As a champion of military might, Nitsi often stirred controversy with his approach to policy. But he was a forward thinker, one who inspired future generations of policymakers and national security leaders to recognize the power of innovation and to break out of, tr of traditional bureaucracy in implementing a new vision. This is the kind of spirit that is fostered here at this school, at SICE, and that I encourage across all of DOD. It is the kind of spirit that has prepared us for great power competition, for the development and deployment of new technologies, and for making the national defense strategy truly irreversible, and undoubtedly successful in the years ahead. I look forward to your questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Secretary. We really appreciated hearing your thoughts. Um, I'll offer a couple questions, and then I'm sure the students and alums have some as well. Since we are at a university, I have to start with a question about grading now. What grade would you give NDS implementation? And I should note, we at SICE are particularly difficult graders. 
I didn't, I didn't know you let students pick their own grades. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to grade myself. I'm going to leave that to you all. Sometimes you get too close to the problem. And so I just say this much. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, I, I said in the end about Nitzi, and what he said is you have to, you have to be innovative. You have, to, you have to think differently. You have to lead people to think differently, to, to kind of buck the system, to change the inertia, uh, to, to think differently, get outside the box. And I think there are areas where I see bright spots, and there are areas that still need a lot of work. But I'm committed. I've always said my top priority in the building is implementing the NDS. And uh, we've gone about that quite aggressively. I've been saying that since my nomination hearing. Uh, we had a senior leaders conference in last fall where I sat down with all the commanders and civilian leaders. And we mapped out uh, 10 broad areas with detailed objectives based on time and clear metrics to, to uh, map out how we're going to implement the NDS over the next two years. And so I'm fully committed to that. You see it in, in my, my, my remarks, I think hopefully in my actions, more importantly. And uh, we're going to continue to keep pushing along. And as I sit down at events like this, or uh, as I often do, meet with folks from think tanks, uh, from industry and whatnot, I take in the feedback and I hear where we're doing well and uh, where we need to do better. So I, I would like to hear from all of you. I'll let you grade me. <laughs> Great. Thank you. It is really extraordinary to hear the NDS acronym ad infinitum throughout the Pentagon, throughout Washington, overseas. I mean, it's a real, I think, testament to you and your predecessor that folks have internalized it. Uh, I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about numbers. You're trying to make some hard changes, as you noted, through COCOM reviews, through new governance models. And yet, we are constantly hearing things like the Navy saying we need 355 ships. Mm -hmm. um, how are you going to be able to, to square those real challenges? Well, it is, uh, th there are a lot of challenges, and uh, we need to meet them all. You know, we, uh, what we need to do is get a solid budget. I think in the years ahead, we're going to need to get back on a trajectory of 3 to 5% real growth. Uh, annually, and um, uh, to make sure that we can sustain those changes, because we're going through this period now. We're getting rid of the legacy of the Cold War and the last 18 years of low-intensity conflict, whether it's whether it's doctrinally or whether it is, um, uh, of course, uh, equipment. We need to make this transition to the future force, and that takes uh, that takes time and money and change and leadership and support from Congress and from you know institutions like this. And then we can tackle those, those uh, the bigger issues. We can, we can talk later if you want about uh, the Navy and shipbuilding in, in particulars. But, but uh, that's what we need to do. We need to just push hard, have a clear vision. I think uh, the NDS, uh, what Secretary Mattis gave us and his team at that time was, a, was a, a great document, a great vision. And we will continue to improve upon it over time. But it is a, it is a strategy that everybody is unified behind. It gets broad bipartisan support. And that's why my commitment is implementing uh, I found in both the private sector and pub public sector, when you sit around a table, a lot of people have good ideas. The challenge is always implementation. That's the challenge right there. And you got it. What you have to do is make sure people have clearly assigned tasks, tasks, uh, suspenses, and metrics, and hold them to it. And that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. That's terrific to hear. Could you tell us a little bit about the challenge posed by the Middle East? Of course, the NDS is trying to get at China and Russian great power competition. But there are questions of deterrence in the Middle East, trying to figure out how much is enough, how to satisfy the insatiable demands of, of that region. Yeah, well, since we're citing previous Secretary of Defense, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. You know, you, you deal with the world you have, not the world you want. <laughs> and so uh, the world I want, uh, the world I have, includes Iran, which has uh, been the sponsor of malign activity throughout the Middle East now since, for 40 years since the revolution. Uh, you know, the IRGC and all their proxies are all the way from Africa through the Middle East into, um, um, into Afghanistan for sure, and you can find them in all parts of the world. So, uh, uh, and, and they, are, they are testing us, and uh, they are very active, and they are causing turmoil throughout the Middle East. So uh, my challenge there is to make sure that we, we reassure our friends and allies that we continue the enduring defeat of ISIS in Syria and elsewhere, mm -hmm. And number three, that we deter Iranian uh, bad behavior. And so I have to do that. At the same time, uh, I want to do that with, uh, with the right size force while I continue to make all these other changes that will require us, that, that lead us toward implementing the NDS, which is put China number one as our top strategic competitor, and number two, Russia. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, too, that China and Russia are also in the Middle East. And so there's, a, there's an element of competition there as well, also, that I have to pay close attention to. Indeed. So 
You mentioned the Space Force, mm -hmm. and increasingly we're hearing calls for a new Goldwater Nichols or a new Key West agreement. Folks are saying, look, there's more domains we have to worry about. We've got new services, um, changes in the security environment. Can you tell us a little bit about how you think organization is or is not working, roles and missions? Do we, do we kind of need to rethink the system, or is it largely right? Those are good questions. Those are good questions for, for, for you all and many others to think about. At, at some time, I will, it, it's worth me looking at. But I think right now, uh, things are working. I, I, I think any shortcomings are, are largely put on my plate. And again, I, I think we can get distracted by those. My focus is implement the NDS. Mm -hmm. Let's just get moving. I want to get to the point where we have, as I said, irreversible momentum, where that uh, it, just the, the whole wave of change sweeps over us, and uh, everybody comes along for the ride. And we get to that point where we're, we're facing the, 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 the challenges we see in the future. I talk to people all the time, and I say, look, I, I know Iran is right here in front of us, and North Korea over here is right in front of us, and we have to deal with terrorists and all that. If we keep focusing on the near term, we will miss the long term, and we will fall irreversibly behind. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. The Chinese have used at least the last 18 years while we were involved in Iraq and Afghanistan to make enormous strides. Sure with regard to the professionalization of their force, uh, modernizing their doctrine, uh, uh, building new capabilities, going after us asymmetrically. And by the way, I'd say they started that before that. They started, my war was the Gulf War, 1990-91. They started then. They saw what we did, what the United States military did using um, um, uh, precision-guided munitions, uh, satellites, you name it, and they, they studied us, and they've made great strides, and we've got to start paying attention or else we will find ourselves where, where we won't be able to sustain our overmatch. Absolutely, and, and obviously you're dealing with the challenges. And, and just to be, not, not because we're seeking war, but we're, we want to deter war, it's peace through strength. Mm -hmm. keep, keep the balance right, Main, maintain you, you have sufficient deterrence so, so that we can continue to compete economically mm -hmm. and not let it spill over into the military realm. I'm sorry. No, th no, thank you, and, and as you're trying to do all of this, you had talked about this issue of the money. Right. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts, where you see defense spending going over the coming years. And in particular, you, know, you have this compelling strategy, and I think an international security environment that, that is supporting it. How do you get Congress to actually take the steps necessary? Well, the message I've been sending now for two years since I became uh, uh, Army Secretary in, in 2017 was to just try and shake people and say, look, we have what we have. There's not going to be any moment like uh, when President Reagan came into office and you'll see defense budgets go through the roof in a peacetime environment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so what that means is we have to get our minds fixed on that because the nation has larger fiscal challenges, whether it's the de deficit, you know, rising interest on the debt. We can talk about the, the growth of mandatory spending. We can go through all. That's a whole budget discussion. But we have to brace ourselves for the fact that, uh, that at best, defense spending will be, uh, be level. I, I want to get it to, to grow to inflation, as I said, 3 to 5 percent annually. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, that means, really what it means is we have to dig deep and really have to look at ourselves. We should be able to fight, the, we should be able to defend our great country uh, with, with the amount of money we're given. And that means we're going to have to make tough choices. And I'm prepared to make the tough choices. And that's where I need Congress's support. There's a lot of talk all the time about reform, and we need to reform and do things differently. Uh, I'm going to put things on Congress's plate uh, next week and in the succeeding weeks and months, and we're going to, it's going to be time to help me make tough choices. Uh, but that's what it's going to take if we're going to, again, either shed legacy things or make the hard calls with important but lower priority programs that just don't stand the test when you look at what we need to do with regard to hypersonics or AI or 5G. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and in that vein, do you think the department will be able to try to kind of leapfrog Russia and China in those sorts of, of, of kind of key technologies? The, the leapfrog suggests we're behind, and I think we're ahead in many, many areas. And I think the key is to sustain that overmatch and grow it over time. I've said particularly with technologies like AI, I think whoever gets there first and can implement it, implementation is key, and get it throughout the force, I think you have a, uh, you, you could likely change the character of war for some time to can't come for many years, and I think it's important to get there first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you think the department needs any new authorities or tools in, the, in, in that regard? Or generally, it, it's, it's got, you know, it's in a, it's in a pretty decent place. There, there are things at the margin that we will ask for in terms of reform and, and some other stuff like that, but generally, the challenge is on us. It's a leadership mm -hmm. challenge. It's a cultural challenge to kind of get beyond, again, think about the future, don't think about the present, and uh, be willing to get outside the box and make, make tough choices.
No and doubt. And that's, that's tough for us as human beings. Most people aren't inclined that way. Indeed, and you have the headlines, of course, that make your job a whole lot harder, no doubt. Um, let me ask you one more question, and then I look forward to, to turning the folks in the audience. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us how you assess the civil military balance in the Pentagon? How, how are things along those how, lines? How do you, tell me how you define a civil military balance, because people define it different ways. Well, one could look at it, obviously, vis-a-vis -vis Congress or vis-a-vis -vis the White House, but I was just thinking in, inside the department. Yeah, so that, that's one way that I think about it is, too. So what I've tried to do when I came in really to, is to integrate uh, the civilian and military side of things. When I was Army Secretary, we'd have meetings just with the civilians, and then the, 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 the uniform guys would have their meetings, and the, the chiefs would have their meetings. And what I did on week one was to really say, on Mondays, we're going to have two sets of meetings. We're all going to get together, and we're going to cover uh, weekly priorities review. So uh, what I do is go over a set of issues quarterly that are top of mind for me, whether it's a development of uh, or modernization of the force. I look at people issues. I look at um, other things like uh, reform of defense health agency. And on, on the afternoons, what we do is we look at NDS implementation. And we review uh, war plan development, off plan development with regard to China, Russia, uh, things like that. And we all sit together as a joint uniform and civilian team. That's number one. Number two, I've put policy, our policy folks, uh, right in the middle of all those, all, all those planning with regard to the joint staff. So we much, much better bonding between the joint staff. And I'm always very conscious when I'm in, in tough times to make sure that we have our civilian and military leadership at the table. So in the moments about a month ago when we were facing off with Iran, many times I sat uh, nearly all the time with, with both my military and civilian leaders mm -hmm. there to help provide advice and input and weigh things out. Because I think together, the more minds you put at the table, the better. And it also certainly improves coordination between whether it's the services and the commands, the, the joint staff and the OSD staff, or just the uniform side and the okay. civilian side. I think it's important to keep building those relationships. Absolutely. That's tremendous to hear. You know, we've had alums like the former Deputy Secretary Bob Work or the current Commandant of the Marine Corps, Dave Berger. So their, their successors are sitting in this audience, Good. and I suspect they like hearing that. Great. Um, let me turn to the audience now for some questions. Please raise your hand. We have folks coming around with, uh, with mics. There's one all the way in the back. And please introduce yourself. The, with the budget uh, and the forces that you have available, is it going to be necessary to, to draw back, to slow down on op tempo, operational tempo demands on the people and equipment to buy space for modernization uh, and, and reinvesting and implementing the NDS? And if so, how's that going? Uh, the short answer is yes, and, and not just for those reasons. Uh, I want to slow the op tempo down some so that we can uh, make sure that we're not running our people into the ground. And not just our active duty forces, but uh, maybe more importantly, our reserve component forces. So some of you may know from my bio, I served 21 years, uh, 10 on active duty, but 11 in the Guard and Reserve. So I have a special appreciation for what it means for a guardsman or reservist to have to leave home, come back, leave your employer. And, and it's particularly tough on those compo, what we call compo two and compo three. But uh, so that's one facet. The other facet is, is slow down the pace, uh, slow down the, uh, the COCOM demand, if you will. Um, uh, so that I have, so troops, units, et cetera, have more time at home to train and prepare for future conflict, again, against uh, either China or Russia. And then third is the whole uh, budget piece of that. I mean, operations drive uh, our own M costs. Uh, so you have, I'm very conscious of that, but I got to get it all back into a balance that is sustainable over the long term, again, for people, for equipment, for, for our own future modernization. Thank you. Next question. Yes, Ali up in front. I, I can hear you. Yeah, I probably don't hear you. <laughs> uh, my name is Ali Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, uh, we hear a lot about great power competition in the Middle East and mm -hmm. the Asia Pacific with Russia and China. What I hear much less about is competing with them in other regions like Latin America, like Africa. I'm curious if you think that we should be paying more attention to those regions and why we don't discuss that as often in the Washington, D.C. Yeah, the short answer is yes, we should, and I will tell you we are. I'm paying very close attention to you. As I said in my opening remarks, we've, I'm going to do uh, reviews of all the combatant commands, not just the geographic but the functional, to, look for, to make sure that we're thoroughly aligned with the national defense strategy. And as I've gone through um, uh, both AFRICOM and SOUTHCOM, both areas where we see uh, Russian and Chinese presence, I'm asking ourselves, you know, as you, I'm asking the commanders, your number one thing is I want to make sure you're paying attention to your 
work plans and contingency plans. But next is great power competition. And so I'm trying to reorder that. Uh, people might say that in, in Southcom, uh, number one was, is, is counter drug. Uh, and in AFRICOM, it's counter terrorism. What I'm trying to do is move up great power competition to make sure that we're competing at the right places with the right people uh, against the Russians and Chinese to make sure that we're holding on to key terrain, if you will. Now, both those theaters in particular are places where it's not just a military. In fact, I would argue you need more of a whole government approach, particularly in Africa, uh, where, you could, where you, we could leverage, I think, uh, uh, we should leverage AID, a lot of State Department functions, a whole, whole of government approach to really <laughs> compete more effectively against the Russians and Chinese. Uh, I need to get my own house in order first. I mean, our folks there are doing a great job, but I want to fine tune that uh, so that I'm focused on the NDS, and if I can free up resources, I will do that to get back to uh, that gentleman's question just before yours. And then we got to build it out so that we take a full interagency approach to this. It seems, if I could just add to Elia's great question, that the GOCOM commanders often ask for so much because they feel the risk themselves, like it's on their shoulders. Is there anything you can do to help alleviate that? Well, sure. I, what, what we have to do is, and what we've begun, is scoping down the tasks and requirements. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the Joint Staff has done very effectively is, is look at what are the tasks uh, required of these COCOMs and what has built up over 15, 20, 25 years. It is in the hundreds. And so we're going through those and trimming them down and making sure we ask ourselves, is this still relevant today? Um, if it's relevant, is it still a high enough priority to task? And that way I can scope that mission down to something that is far, far more appropriate. And then, of course, the tough choice is, at the end of the day, I bear the risk. I own the risk. And uh, that's how we're trying to calibrate that. That's how the building works, mm -hmm. and that's how the commands work, and we have to get that right. Thank you for stating that. Yes, friend. Uh, sir, my name is Brandon Patrick. I'm a strat student here also. Uh, I think that, going back to the Middle East for a moment, the strike on uh, Qasem Soleimani, I think, caught a lot of us here by surprise when that happened. Um, you know, as far as the level of the escalation there, you know, Qasem Soleimani was one of those few unifying figures within Iran. What was the strategic benefit, the long-term strategic benefit in, uh, in striking? Well, the long-term term strategic benefit is we took off the playing field, the battlefield, and he was on the battlefield as a battlefield commander, uh, one of their most effective commanders, uh, somebody who was a, a, a terrorist leader of a U.S.-designated foreign terrorist organization who had the blood of hundreds of Americans on his hands over many, many years. By the way, he had the, the blood of hundreds of other people around the world on his hands, too, including the Iranian people. And so uh, it was an easy decision for me uh, to make that, as it was for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Again, he had uh, the blood of Americans on his hand, as recently as, I think, the attack of December 27th that the IRGC was behind, and he was actively planning a next attack. And so uh, I, I think taking him off the field, uh, a, a, a battlefield leader off the battlefield, uh, was, was, a, was a good response to Iranian bad behavior and, and his personal actions over many, many years. Thank you. Uh, yes. I have a loud voice. I can project it. That's fine. Sir, it's an honor to meet you. My name is Sandra Salvatore. I'm part of the Marvel DIA Cohort, mm -hmm. Doctor of International Affairs. And my thesis happens to be. So, right, I was thinking of another DIA. Sorry. Well, <laughs> uh, I happen to have experience in that area. Um, but uh, actually, my thesis happens to be. Uh, trying to define the whole government approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I appreciate the fact that you brought that up because uh, I am also a reservist, and when I was deployed to Horn of Africa, that's where it really came up for me, sure. and I was an AFRICOM uh, stand, I helped stand up AFRICOM as well, so I appreciate that, and I oh, hope an opportunity service. to interview you as part of my dissertation. But uh, my question <laughs> is, my, but my question is uh, the, real, the reality of trying to change and innovate mm -hmm. the Department of Defense. We have in our cadre of 15s and SES is people who have a lot of experience but may not be the right fit for where, where we're trying to go. Mm -hmm. And I was curious how, what levers do you feel that you have available to you or that you feel like you need in order to get to where you want to go? Yeah, well, you, you, not, not everyone is an innovator. We're just, we're all built differently. And uh, you, you, if you're, you have to be not only an innovator, but you have to be willing to be a disruptor. And, uh, and so not all people are built that way. So I think you've got to find those innovators and disruptors, and you've got to empower them. You've got to bring them up through the ranks, right? We've got to do that in the military side. That was something I focused on as Secretary of the Army. You've got to reward those people and, and kind of protect them. 
Um, and then you get, so you, you get that group of people, then you get the, the people who just won't get there, and you gotta, you gotta pull them along, and if you can't pull them along, then maybe they need to find another, an, another occupation. And then you get the fence sitters, and what you gotta do is really win over the fence sitters and convince them that, look at the benefits, and, and sometimes it's kind of deferred, it's, it's, it's a deferred benefit, right? It's something it takes time to see, it's, you know, it's putting money in a bank. And so uh, you just have to bring those groups around as carefully as possible and as, 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 as smartly as possible, but as quickly as possible, because otherwise the bureaucracy will just swallow you up. And the thing is, I tell folks, just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. It's, you know, I was an infantry officer. It's what we tell So Just keep moving forward. Don't stop. When you stop, you're dead. It's, you know, get off the beach, right? Keep going. And so you just got to gotta keep doing it. You got to be conscious of what's coming up. You, you can't let the... Uh, you, you, you can't let the naysayers drag you down. And, um, and so that's the challenge, just keep pushing forward. And that's what I tell people. And, but you gotta, again, you gotta find the leaders out there, both the formal and informal leaders who can help, help get you there. And uh, as we did the defense-wide review over three and a half months, I sat through 20-some sessions. You, you really, you could tell in a heartbeat the folks who came up and said, this is my organization, this is my mission, but I can do it better. Here are the things I'm willing to do differently. And in one case, a couple cases, I had folks say, look, I can find 8% in savings. I'm willing to give it to you now, Mr. Secretary. But, you know, I'd what I'd like to really do is let you give me money back. You know, give me some of that back, and I'll put it here. And that's an easy decision for me. You know, go for it. And you've got to reward those people, too. Thank you. Uh, yes, over here. Uh, hi there. Uh, Gregory Kist, uh, Strat Sydney here as well. You've talked a bit about uh, great power competition with Russia and China. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit, a bit about how the department plans to respond to gray zone threats emanating from those countries. What, what threats? Gray zone threats. So like uh, yeah. Russia's use of the Wagner Group mer mercenaries or China's use of civilian vessels to harass Navy ships in the South China Sea. Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, we have a variety of means to do that as, as well. We, um, we, we do through information ops. Uh, we challenge them. You know, we, we can, we, oftentimes, we've done this before, you know, we would just outright ask them, are these your forces? And if they say no, then we know what we can do and what we can't do. And so there are very, we, we can use our own type of great tactics, asymmetrical tactics. So I think we've learned a lot. You, you know, the Russians did some in, great innovation on that when it came to Ukraine and uh, other places. So uh, we, we have to be more aggressive on that front. I think, again, building out our partnerships with uh, uh, allies and others. Uh, we're doing a good deal of that in the Asia Pacific and in the Indo-Pacific. I've spent a lot of time with, uh, uh, with our partners out there to talk about, uh, like you said, whether it's use, use of the maritime militia by the Chinese and others, is how do we band together and stand up. It's, you also have to use um, you know, the, 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 the things we do in the international space. You know, can you come up with a code of conduct that most countries can agree to that sets a new norm? And there are things like that where we can, we, you, you got to box them in so we get, again, get these countries to start behaving like normal countries and obeying the international rules-based order. Uh, not that we shouldn't look at the rules-based order and ask ourselves, is it, is it right for the time? We should always do that. But when you're openly not only challenging it, but flaunting it, ignoring it, breaking it, that's when we have problems. Yes, up here. Either one. Go ahead. You can even do both. You both. Mr. Secretary of Defense, you mentioned uh, alliances uh, and also the NATO uh, leaders meeting. I was very lucky to participate at a NATO Engages conference in London, and I would say um, one area where the leaders managed to break the ground um, uh, this year was on China. And indeed, mm -hmm. China is, um, there is a reference in the NATO um, uh, London Declaration on China. I was wondering from a U.S. perspective, how would you assess uh, or how should NATO adapt to, um, um, to, to China's strategic uh, competition? And the second question, in the context of uh, Brexit, um, how would you assess the uh, UK uh, global repositioning, uh, particularly on the transatlantic dimension, and what kind of uh, um, partnership is the US envisaging? Thank you. I'm not sure I understood all the second question. I'll just say we, we, we continue our special uh, relationship with the UK. It's very close. I've met many times with my counterpart. He's a good man and a very capable defense minister. And we just continue to build those ties between us, and I, I talk a lot to them. On, on the first question um, with regard to NATO, you're right. We've, we've come a long way. I've been to three or four NATO defense ministerials now. 
in my role, I go again uh, next week, I think. And in each, each time we talk about China. It's, uh, it's something that many of us have come late to understanding, even in this country. I think it's only been the last few years that we've kind of all uh, woken up and realized what's going on. And uh, a, lot, a lot of that has been driven by the new leader, not, not, not the new leader, but uh, you, you know, uh, President Xi, who has taken the, the country in a very different direction than where it was. And so uh, I think folks are waking up to that, uh, have in this country for the most part. Um, but in Europe, it, it's, it's a little bit harder, and they're a little bit behind us there. Some countries, some NATO allies are there already. Others are, are further behind. So it's a, it's a continuous engagement. I will talk about it again next week in Europe. But again, I think the more that we, we as an alliance can talk about uh, the challenges that Russia and China, obviously Russia is much closer to the NATO alliance, but China as well, uh, opposed to, again, the international rules-based order, all the things we value, our shared interests, I think many countries get it. And uh, I think it helps us uh, in terms of standing up to the Chinese and not buying into their you know, Belt and Road strategy that ends up being a debt trap for some countries, or Huawei, which uh, threatens uh, our, our networks that could really um, impair, impede uh, the alliance in terms of intelligence sharing or operationally or doing operational planning. So I think it's all coming along. We continue to have that dialogue, and I think we're, we're moving in the right direction for the most part. Thank you. Yes, and back. Um, hi, Mr. Secretary. My name's, excuse me, my name's Sean Gibbons. And um, you spoke a lot about today so far about uh, efficiency and streamlining. And um, I w was wondering what are some, I mean, how do you combat sort of institutional and congressional constituencies for, for things like, say, the F-15 um, or, or other platforms that, um, you know, have, have sort of inbuilt pressures to kind of perpetuate themselves as opposed to moving on to newer platforms like the F-35. How do you kind of um, navigate those pressures? Well, I've, I've yet to find a program that doesn't have a constituency somewhere <laughs> in D.C. If you can find it, let me know. <laughs> because I'll either boast, boost it or kill it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I try and be very clear as I can. I've been speaking about implementing the NDS for some time now. I, I did it in the Army. And uh, very clear that I'm willing to make tough choices and cut programs or reduce programs. And I try and be transparent with members of Congress and be very forthright in what we're doing and why. <laughs> that doesn't mean it, it doesn't guarantee you smooth sailing. But uh, you, you know, there are a core group of members up there, particularly on the defense committees, that recognize that we need, to, uh, we need to do better, we need to make changes, we need to be more efficient. And uh, th they are great supporters, great anchors. Uh, they also give us good advice. And so relying on them to help us is also critical. And it's a, that's a bipartisan group, by the way. So it, I think it's leaning on folks like that to, to help you know, other members get over the, the humps, the hurdles, as we, as we put things up that may be important to them uh, or that they feel strongly about. And, and many times it's they're, they're getting bad information from others or they're reading about things in the paper that's not accurate. And so again, it just has to be transparent, informational, provide the facts. Uh, I'm not, we're, we just, I have a very clear agenda. I'm trying to implement the national defense strategy. In a, in, a, in a world where I have fixed, you know, relatively fixed budget, I have a fixed number of soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, I got a fixed number of platforms, et cetera. I can't, I can't do everything. And uh, you, gotta make, you gotta make tough choices, you gotta prioritize. Thank you, yes, up, uh, up here. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Henry Newsom, a recent, well, I think it's recent, it's about 10 or 12 years ago, alum, <laughs> st uh, strategic studies alumnus. Inside the Beltway, the corner of the realm has changed from counterinsurgency to great power competition over the past few years. It is undoubtedly prudent to be prepared for a large-scale conflict with China or Russia, and the business that I run is invested in that challenge. Regardless, someday American forces will fight and suffer hundreds or thousands of casualties in a short period. Is that future conflict more likely to be against a great power or an insurgency? Well, I, I, don't, I don't see conflict as inevitable. Uh, so uh, I, I think what we're trying to do is avoid conflict. And I think, again, you, you avoid conflict by being strong enough to deter one. And I think it's in our interest, Russia's interest, China's interest. I don't think any of us are seeking conflict per se. Uh, so we, we, we try and lead and manage very carefully. Uh, when you pose it against uh, on the counterterrorism side, I don't see a counterterrorism conflict resulting in hundreds of thousands. I think that's the number you gave. I think counter hundreds or, hundreds or thousands. Oh, I, okay, I'm sorry. 
I think counter, I think terrorism is going to be with us for for the rest of my natural life. Uh, it's going to be a generational conflict until we solve its its roots. You know, uh, whether they are cultural, religious, uh, economic, whatever the case may be, and I, that's where I, truly I think it requires a whole of government and a uh, and a multilateral approach. So what the NDS says, the NDS is not. Uh, <coughs> exclusive with regard to Russia and China, it's very broad. It says your first priorities will be China, then Russia. Then second, you've got to deal with, the, with the, the rogue states, if you will, Iran, North Korea, and others like them. And it says we have to continue to have a capability and to deal with uh, violent extremist organizations. And so uh, my challenge, and I, I think we do it very well, particularly through our special operation forces, but, but, but all, is to balance all those three out so that we can continue to, to avoid a um, uh, you know, the next 9-11, God forbid, or something like that. And so that's part of what I'm doing right now is to make sure the force is properly uh, manned and trained, equipped, resourced, et cetera, along all those three areas, with the priority being the first, right, great power competition, so that we don't find ourselves in something that you described. And would you say, Mr. Secretary, that China and Russia are largely deterred today? Well, I, I think so. I mean, none of us, uh, none of us want conflict. I've speak, I've, I've speak to my counterparts in China and Russia. Uh, it's part of what I'm trying to do: make sure we have clear lines of communication to avoid misunderstanding, to avoid miscalculation, whatever. And they're always very civil discussions, and uh, we lay out an interest. But I don't think anybody wants conflict. I think, uh, again, the more we can keep our competition in the, in the economic realm, the better. Uh, but countries have their interests too, and ours is defending this rules-based order. It's defending freedom of navigation, freedom of commerce. It's defending human rights, uh, religious freedom, uh, uh, freedom of the press, etc. So we got to balance all those things out, and um, and again, hopefully, we can keep it restricted to the economic realm or the political realm, and it doesn't spill over into uh, a military one because I, that would would not be good for anybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yes, over here. morning. My name is Lansdale Henderson. I'm a recent graduate of the Global History Program. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for speaking this morning mm -hmm. for your service. Um, my question has to do with European leadership uh, related to uh, her question uh, in global power, great power competition. And you'd mentioned the priority of robust alliances, restructuring AFRICOM, where France has a strong counterterrorism presence, NATO spending, and in particular, great power competition. So my question is, uh, Post-Brexit, does the United States need a special relationship within the European Union? And if so, um, who and why? Yeah, so uh, we have a lot of relationships with, uh, with countries in the EU. Uh, I, I know the head of the EU. Uh, uh, she's very capable. I've gotten to know her. And uh, many, uh, obviously many NATO allies and partners, our members, are in the EU as well. And what we also try to do at our NATO defense ministerials is we, we often have a, a dinner where we all get together with, with the members of the EU as well, uh, countries and the head of EU. So it's, it's a, there's a very good dialogue going on. EU is, uh, is obviously, with regard to the European countries, central to what they do. In many ways, we need the EU's help to, uh, to improve the infrastructure among, uh, in the countries of many of, our Europe, many of our NATO allies because we need them to build either you know, build, help, build, help improve the road network, the rail network, bridges, et cetera, to facilitate our lines of communication, our movement of troops and, uh, and flights and whatnot. So having that relationship and that communication with the EU is very important, and we work with them. And again, we have countries who are very close to us, um, who are either NATO allies and are in the EU that help. And we also have countries who are in the EU but not NATO allies who we do a lot of, you know, we engage a lot with who are very helpful as well. Thank you for that. Yes, there's a question over here. Shay? Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I'm Shay Kitiri, second year strategic studies student. Uh, we are at the birthplace of Supreme Command here, and uh, there are many vacancies from the rank of undersecretary uh, below, uh, all the way below. And my question is, uh, does that undermine civilian authority and uh, make impl implementation of the NDS more difficult? And why are there so many vac vacancies? I'm sorry, does, does what undermine civilian authority? Uh, vacancies in civilian positions from undersecretary, assistant secretary positions and below. Yeah, I, th I think that's overstated. Uh, it, it you know, becomes a theme at time for different departments. Uh, I think we have 50, 60 
uh, Senate confirmed positions, and I think only a dozen or so are unfilled. Uh, and, and those that are unfilled, I think most of those are somewhere either on the Hill or being vetted through the White House. Uh, I've, been, I've worked in the Pentagon four or five times now, going all the way back to 1994. You probably weren't even born then. Um, I will tell you that vacancies in DOD are a common thing. Uh, it happens all the time. It's their tough, demanding jobs. Anybody here work at DOD? I mean, they're tough jobs. I mean, it's, it's the only place where somebody says the meeting tomorrow is at 7, and you have to say AM or PM. So we burn people out pretty quickly, and it is a high threshold to come in because you are entrusted with uh, national security issues. Uh, you're, you're given us, not given, you, but you're you know, vetted for a security clearance, and we entrust you to do a lot of hard work and put your heart and soul into it. So uh, vacancies are not a, not a new thing. We stay on top of it. We manage it. Uh, one of the things you do in these roles, or you, pick, you always make sure that you, the people you pick are very capable, or you have some who are very capable of of, of uh, es escalating up into an acting role, and we have very good acting folks doing that now. But this is just the nature of doing business. Uh, it was the same way in the private sector. Uh, when I was in the private sector, we'd, we would have vacancies, fewer of them, because you can hire people more quickly. There was a, a larger pool of talent out there, if you, if you will, to draw from. Um, so uh, it's, it's not, uh, I have no doubt that we can continue to conduct our mission, execute it faithfully, and, uh, and do what we need to do. And there's no doubt between the uniform and the civilians that that uh, civilian control of the military is, a, is, an, is something, as is a tradition, a practice, an institutional thing going back, you know, generations. So there's no doubt in my mind about any of that. Thank you. Uh, right up here. Sorry. Thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. Uh, my name is Rob Wilson. I'm a first-year American foreign policy student. And my question for you is regarding Afghanistan. Uh, I'm wondering if you could discuss where you see U.S. strategy in Afghanistan in the next five, ten years? In Afghanistan? In Afghanistan. I think it's very simple. Is we want to make sure that Afghanistan uh, never again becomes a place from which uh, terrorists, terrorist groups can launch an attack against the United States. I mean, that's the end state I'm trying to achieve. And I think, uh, I think our military, our diplomatic corps, our other parts of the government have done a great job. Knock wood, we haven't seen that since 9-11. And that's, that's the mission uh, for me, period. Thank you. There's a question right up here. Chris Grawl, current uh, Strat student. So you mentioned certain uh, reforms the department is making, yet uh, bureaucracies are notoriously resistant to change. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could share some of the examples of resistance that you've encountered to implementing the NDS and how you've overcome that uh, resistance. <laughs> nice well, question. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to call anybody out. You can. It's, it's fair to say that nearly any change requires some resistance, period. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's like every program has a constituency, and often the constituency be begins with those who work on it. And uh, so that, that's tough. And what you've got to promise people, again, that, there is, that, that, that this is the path forward. This is what we're trying to achieve. It's not going to affect, in most cases, nearly all cases, it's not going to affect your livelihood. But you've got to get people off the dime to do things differently. And, uh, and, and you can look, in, in the Army, we... we you know, we propose to cut or reduce, I think, uh, I'm re forgetting the numbers now, maybe 186 programs. And uh, we were able to pull off uh, nearly 100, at least 185, and I think 186 is pending. So I think change is hard, but I, I think with the right commitment, the right leadership, you have to have a good leadership team. And, uh, and we have that. We had that, too. is critical. But uh, ev look, everything, you couldn't bring five people together and, and, and get them all to agree on something without somebody saying they object or they, you know, you just got to work your way through that. So it just requires leadership. And sometimes it's collective leadership. Sometimes it's personal leadership. And sometimes, oftentimes, you just got to ignore the naysayers and just keep moving forward. Thank you. We'll take uh, one final question in back. Hi, sir. Chris Bowen. I'm a SIS alum and former infantryman. We talk a lot about lethality. It's one of the overarching themes of the NDS and is the number one LOE within the department. Uh, technologically, we've uh, increasing said lethality is kind of, uh, it's, we've pursued that through the modernization priorities. From an operational and a joint force perspective, one of the issues <laughs> that you've pursued is the establishment of the Close Combat Lethality Task Force. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on the status of the task force and its future? Yeah, the task force is uh, still up and running. I had a chance to visit with them, um, I think, in December to, to take some time to walk around, find out how they're doing, talk to them about issues. It's a task force that's near, to, near and dear to my heart as a, as a former infantryman myself. So 
It's, uh, it's something I want to preserve. What we're going to do probably is transition it to the Army because something like that needs a strong foundation, a backbone up upon which its ideas can then filter out. The Army obviously provides the uh, largest share of, uh, of uh, infantry, if you will, infantry and special operators. So nesting it right there, uh, Secretary McCarthy's a big believer in, in it too, will allow it to more quickly get its ideas and, uh, and, and innovations out into the field. And, uh, and so we've leveraged it fairly well. I think we can continue to work on it and do better. But uh, I, think it's, uh, I do think that's something we need to continue to invest in, the, in your average infantrymen, your special operator, those folks on the ground. Those are the folks that do most of the fighting and suffer most of the casualties. And we've got to keep advancing either their, you know, improving their tactics, the technologies, the uh, uh, personal protective equipment, weapons, et cetera, uh, so that, so that uh, you know, person to person on the battlefield, we have a distinct advantage. But I'd say at the end of the day, and I thought this is where you're going, it's not, yes, technology is a factor, but it's the people we recruit and it's the people we train. I, I think makes all the difference. And the fact that we train jointly together is what's going to separate um, uh, the American soldier or American Marine on the battlefield against any of his or her peers. And that's the key part that we need to keep developing is the individual soldier, Marine, special operator, you name it, uh, the NCO Corps, which is the backbone of our military, and then, of course, the people, the leadership above them, the officer corps above them. So to me, that's, the, that's the, the game changer right there and always will be. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being so generous with your time and your insights. Good. Please join me in thanking him. <laughs> thank you. Thank Good you point much. from the school. Thank, thank you so much. You. We've got you slated to exit out this way, so I'll take you out. Please stay in your seats. Thank, thank you. Thank you.